everyone is destined by Christ to rise I have cried though walking with God let me tell you the truth if anybody tells you walking with God is just full of laughter you are joking it's not the God of the Bible every generation will not be confused there is a generation that will get this thing said the compressed of the from that day the creative dimension of the prophetic let it boil inside, first of all, then flow outside. Let the fire fall, let the river flow. First let it burn inside, hey, and flow outside. you're still praying in the spirit for a minute or two someone is still praying in the spirit for a minute or two release that let worship from within flow. your spirit make it a prayer let your river flow let it burn inside and flow outside let your fire fall let your river flow. Just let it burn inside of me. Then let it flow outside. It's all over this place. The fire of prayer. The fire of celebration. The fire of prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to realize that something very prophetic is happening in this place. Not just in this place, but over this nation. We're going to be seated shortly, but let me just respond to prophecy. We are going to shout seven hallelujahs. It means halal Yeshua. I sense there is a warring going on in the atmosphere of America right now as I speak. I don't know what it is, but I know that there is something going on politically, something going on with government, political power, and the instruction I have is to make a prophetic contribution. Listen, listen, please. This is an apostolic and a prophetic ministry where people of discernment, we came by the Spirit to shift something. Hallelujah. The sound of a trumpet always announces a new season. Even the return of Christ will be heralded by the sound of a trumpet. Hallelujah. And so Pastor Nat is going to lead us. He will blast that trumpet prophetically. Not over us. We are prophesying to America now. That whatever is happening in the atmosphere, we are coming as ambassadors, witnesses, carriers of fire. Are we together? And so once you hear that blast, we're going to shout hallelujah. It means halal Yeshua. Seven times. And at the seventh time, I'll lead you in that shout. At the seventh time, let there be a shout of victory. The kind of shouts that brought the walls of Jericho down. The kind of shout that destroys everything that is not of God. Who is ready to participate in prophecy? Who is ready to bring down ancient walls? Who is ready to tear down altars that have stood against the progress of the program of God over this nation? Are you ready now? Pastor Nath, please. Hallelujah. Ready for number three? Hallelujah, Halal Yeshua over America. Number four, Halal Yeshua, the God of Joshua, the one who rides upon the wings of the wind. Number five, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Are you ready for the seven shouts now? Listen, 
We are going to shout this one together with faith in our hearts. This shout is for America, but it's also for your life. That every wall, every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. for this shout now I want you to see every mountain financial mountains mountains of demonic oppressions the Bible says who are thou mountain before Zerubbabel that before Zerubbabel thou shalt be made plain I want you to release your faith you're not just acting in the flesh by this shout for some of you growths and tumors will die from your body by this shout you will be rewriting stories you will overturn court cases. Do you believe that? It's a sound of revival. Revival is not quiet. Revival is noisy because when the king arises, he arises in power. Is someone ready for this shout? At the blast of the trumpet, jump, shout, do whatever you have to do in the spirit and watch those walls crumble. Once we are done shouting, begin to pray in the spirit for the next one minute. Are you ready now? Pastor Nat, please. Pastor Nat, a few months ago, I was meditating, and while I was in the place of prayer, from the spirit, song began to come into my spirit, and I took my guitar, and I began to play. I didn't know that would be an anthem a capture of a new season in my own life and in this ministry and God has placed such grace something will happen to you as I sing that song breathe Lord breathe breathe Lord breathe breathe upon my life Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Will you breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. I receive, I manifest. Your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom.
says son of man can these bones live again and he said only ah who am I prophesying to can this business live again can this ministry live again can your son live again he said only thou knowest and then he says prophesy prophesy and then there was flesh but there was no life and then he says son of man prophesy to the four winds and say all winds breathe upon this lane and the bible says there arose an exceeding great army we're going to do something very prophetic please take it higher for me right now we're going to do something prophetic in this place right now and I want you to participate. This is a sound of revival. When we came in, Pastor Nat, that was the day before yesterday, I was praying in the morning. And just, I have the instrumentals of this song. And while I was just listening, something came into my spirit. It was a sound from heaven. And that is the sound that I want to bring forth in this place. Mighty things will happen. Do you believe this? It's a very simple sound.
cry Hosanna till the nations see Jesus lifted up, lifted up. We lift you up. Your exalt. over America in the name that is above all names every dry bone in the government in your schools across families in the name that is above all names again we decree again we declare as sent ones from God let breath surge into every dead bone now. Let breath, the breath of life, surge into every dead situation now. In the name of Jesus, we declare America, hear the sound of revival. Hear the sound of restoration. Hear the sound of resurrection. Hear the sound of a new season. We declare it's a new season. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Give Jesus praise for one minute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In an atmosphere like this, anything is possible. Anything is possible. While Pastor Nat blew the trumpet, something happens to me every time he blows that trumpet. Just connects to my spirit. Just connects to my spirit. Hallelujah. For someone I'm hearing in my spirit for you, weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. There may be an area of concern in your life, but hear this prophetic word. Weep not. Weep not. Weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And there's someone here, you are called into the ministry of prophetic psalmistry. One of the reasons why God brought you here is so that you will connect with deeper fountains. This is what I'm hearing in my spirit. And because you are here tonight by the power that raised Christ from the dead, let that oil, like the dew of Hammon, let it rest upon you. Rest upon your ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Be seated for a few minutes. Mighty Dios. Over America. You know, for someone, this will be your spiritual souvenir. You will carry this song as you rejoice. Returning back to your stations is a song of victory. 
is a song of celebration. It's a chant of victory. There is an anointing upon it. It's why you see us staying there. Staying there. We've learned how to host his presence. When he stays, we stay. When he moves, we move. When he stays, we stay. When he moves, we move. Mm. Ay, 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 ay. Amen. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm going to be sharing right now. Please, let's honor Pastor Nat so that he can sit. I know he's been standing. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. I want to teach you this morning. God bless you. I love you too. I want to show you why revivals die. We're considering revival flames. This is part two, the morning session. I'll do a quick recap on what I shared yesterday. And then we'll connect to the new thought for this morning. I want to show you why revivals die. And this is very important, particularly if you're a minister of the gospel here, it's important you understand not just how to ignite revivals, but how to sustain a move of God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. A very quick recap. Yesterday, I began by teaching us how that History is full of time periods where there seems to be an extraordinary move of God across lives, across territories, across nations. We call that a revival. And we said how that a revival is an awakening unto true spirituality, unto righteousness, hallelujah, where people press to love Jesus like never before. They cultivate a zeal for spiritual things. And we call it a reawakening from a state of dormancy. I did teach us yesterday that classically speaking, a revival is always threefold. Number one, a personal revival, it affects an individual. So this is between you and God, a reawakening. Are we together? Number two, revival over the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three, territorial revival like we see in Nineveh, like we see, you know, in Babylon and so on and so forth. And um, I did tell us that there is a threefold, a tripartite signature to authentic, genuine revival. Please don't forget this, that not every spiritual move can be called a revival. There is an exact requirement that must be met for any move whatsoever to be called a revival. Number one, we said the first feature of a true, authentic, God-ordained revival is that there must be restoration of God consciousness and true spirituality. That happens when there is repentance, restoration of holiness, righteousness, and renewed love for Jesus and for spiritual things. Number two, that every genuine revival translates to the multiplication of believers because revivals are souls targeted. It is always targeted at the lost. Hallelujah. Even though the revival happens within the one who is saved, but it is to help that person to be efficient enough to reach the lost multiplication of believers there must be an increase within the community of believers as a result of massive soul winning we see that happen on the day of pentecost three thousand people came to the fold in one day and then number three we said a genuine revival must have a territorial expression there must be territorial transformation captured within a genuine revival that means a restoration to moral excellence restoration of values, economic transformation, technological transformation, 
and so on and so forth. And um, I told us yesterday that every genuine revival is connected to the Great Commission. You remember that? That every genuine revival, every genuine move of God, even that which we expect to happen in America and across the nations of the earth, is connected to the Great Commission. I did not define for you yesterday what the Great Commission is. Just allow me to do that definition and then we'll jump straight to the business of this morning. The Great Commission is defined as a mandate given by Jesus. A mandate given by Jesus. It was first to the disciples and now it extends to all believers. I'll take it again. A mandate given by Jesus initially to the disciples but now to all believers to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. That's the first component. To reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. Number two, to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship. The first dimension or the first compartment of this mandate is to bring the entire globe to the saving knowledge of Jesus by communicating the gospel of salvation. Next is to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship. And then finally, to bring territorial and societal transformation. These are the threefold dimensions that are captured in the Great Commission. So we have world evangelization, number one. Number two, we have transformation through discipleship. And then number three, we have territorial impact. It's important that you broaden your understanding of the Great Commission because for the average believer, our understanding of the Great Commission just stops at soul winning. And while that is correct, that is not complete. The Great Commission has a threefold expression. Number one, soul winning. The global harvest, bringing nations to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And that happens by articulately communicating the gospel. And then number two, discipling nations. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 28. Not just to preach, but to mentor, to disciple nations. Hallelujah. And then number three, territorial transformation. When God is moving, the territory should know. And you know that territorial transformation is beyond just innovations. It is a battle for the spirits and the mind of people. Because everything that happens within a territory is a reflection of the thinking, the belief systems of the people. So the gospel has two components to it. There is the message that saves, but there is the value system that transforms society. It is important that we emphasize not just the message that saves, but the value system that transforms society. Are we learning? So for everyone who desires to see revival, genuine, authentic, lasting revival, it is important that we return back to the mandate, the Great Commission. Now, within the mandate, there are other expressions. When you teach on favor, when you teach on prosperity, there's no time would have gone to Psalm 103. The Bible lists there five or six benefits. So salvation has benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, it says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then it says, forget not his benefits. The emphasis is to focus on the Lord. But in doing so, he says, forget not his benefits. And the Bible begins to list a few benefits. Number one, who forgiveth thine iniquities. Number two, who healeth, you know, your body, your sickness. Number three, who delivereth you from every destruction. Number four, he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies and all of that. There are about five of them. So the things that have occupied our pulpits in terms of doctrinal content, in terms of our emphasis. They are very important, but what we need to do is to bring back the mandate, the Great Commission. 
it is important to teach people on prosperity, important to teach people on living in victory, relational principles, administrative principles, all of these components are important. But in order of priority, all those teachings should not be at the risk of their understanding the mandate. Soul winning, discipleship that brings transformation and then impact upon society. You're understanding me so far? Shout a loud amen. amen. All right, so let's take it a step further now very quickly and examine why revivals fail. I've studied the subject of revival a bit and um, first for myself and then to learn ancient principles for igniting and sustaining a genuine move of God. And in my study, I stumbled across a few factors that have been responsible for the death of many mighty moves. And America, please listen. As much as we have celebrated many moves of God, as much as we have come to ignite another revival, it's important that we know how to sustain the fire, the flames of revival. Hallelujah. Are we learning? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul makes a very interesting statement. He says there is this treasure in earthen vessels. Someone say earthen vessels. One more time, say earthen vessels. So there is this treasure. But there is a problem here that the treasure is locked up within an earthen vessel. Hallelujah. There is this treasure, but that the treasure is locked up within earthen vessels. I wrote something here and then I want you to please listen. Revivals are ignited and sustained across territories to the degree to which God finds yielded, aligned, and trained vessels. Revivals are ignited and revivals are sustained within any territory. That includes America, that includes every and any nation connecting. Revivals are only ignited and sustained when God finds available, yielded, and trained vessels. Available, yielded, and trained vessels. One more time available, yielded, and trained vessels. So when you find a territory bankrupt of a move of God, a genuine awakening, most times it is not because God is hesitant as far as reaching to his people. God's vulnerability over man is not left in the dark. The Bible is clear as to the fact that he always desires to reach down to man right from the Garden of Eden. The Bible says, and the Lord came down walking in the cool of the day. And he said, Adam, where are thou? And Adam said, I heard your voice, but I hid because I was naked. And he says, who told you you were naked? God's vulnerability over man is clear from scripture. I have loved you with an everlasting love and with my loving kindness, I have drawn you. He always desires to reach down to his people, to reconnect them to grace, to glory, to power, to see that they make progress in their lives. So when it looks like the heavens are closed over people, over families, over territories, over nations, it is not to say God's hands um, are not able to be outstretched towards those people. It is that most times, most times, he's yet to find available, yielded, and trained vessels. Please do not forget these expressions. Available, you can be available and yet not yielded. You can be yielded and yet not trained. You need to be available, you need to be yielded, and you need to be trained. Can we say that together? Say available. Someone say I'm available. Number two, you need to be yielded. Say I am yielded. And now through this conference, you're subjecting yourself to this apostolic training. That tells me, surely, that you will be that vessel that will carry that flame, that revival fire. Do you believe that? Amen. So the move of God 
depends on available, yielded, and trained vessels. Now, I helped you understand a spiritual progression yesterday, and I want to do a quick recap on that. The average believer must understand the journey, the spiritual progression. How do we evolve in the spirit from being an unbeliever until we become witnesses? The end point, the end product in a believer's journey is that we become manifestations of the glory of God, but that we also become witnesses. So Jesus finds ordinary men, some fishers, some, you know, involved in business of all sorts, some confused, and he begins to walk them through this pathway until they finally evolve to be mighty apostles, evangelists, witnesses. So let me walk you through for one minute and please lend me your attention. Number one, the journey that leads to a witness, the kind of vessel that can be used to sponsor a revival, it always starts with the unbeliever. The state of being an unbeliever is a default state. Are we together? The psalmist said, in iniquity did my mother conceive me. Scripture says, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So from birth, unfortunately, as a product of the original sin, the Bible teaches that all men, all men by default, outside of their encounter with Jesus, the son of the living God, all men are lost already. No matter how well intentioned, no matter how sincere you are, once you are yet to encounter Jesus, the son of the living God, the Bible says you are spiritually dead. You may be sincere, you may be a nice person, loving person, very kind, but spiritually speaking. So Jesus said it this way, I am come that ye may have life. If you had it, you would not come to give you and that you have that life more abundantly. He was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his then only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his son into the world, are we together, to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that that person shall be saved. And John taught us in his epistle that this is the record, are we still together? That God had given us eternal life and that that life is in his son. So that whoever encounters the son has life. Are we learning now? So everyone you see who has not met Jesus no matter how sincere, no matter how wonderful, how morally right, the Bible describes such a man to be in a state of death spiritually. Now, when you encounter Jesus through what we call the new birth experience, by confessing his lordship over your life and receiving of his life, a transition happens, Paul taught us. Are we learning now that we... We transit from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And there is a new name and a new status we have immediately. We are called believers. We are called believers. We are called believers. Not yet witnesses, but we are called believers. Are we learning now? So the journey starts from being an unsaved person. Now a saved person. But there is still a problem with this one. Because... It's important for you to know that at the point of initial salvation, only your spirit encounters that life. That salvation experience does not impart upon your mind. And because man is tripartite, it's important that the riches of salvation pours into your entire tripartite being. Are we together? So you would find out that someone who just confessed the Lordship of Christ, the wrong thoughts are still there, the wrong thinking is still there, the stronghold is still there, the limitations there, but the person is saved because salvation is a gift. Are we together? Salvation does not require transformation. It is salvation that brings transformation. Salvation simply requires that you believe that report and receive by faith. So here is the believer, level one, or the unbeliever, 
then by confessing the Lordship of Jesus, you become a believer. But if you leave that believer in that state, he becomes a carnal believer and an inefficient one. Do you know why? Because God cannot do much with such an individual. His mind is still unfruitful to spiritual things. In fact, the only reason why you would know that person were saved was because probably you saw the person making the altar call. Nothing about the life of that person will reflect the glory of God because transformation is yet to happen. Are we together? So once an individual becomes saved, please listen, the next assignment is he's introduced to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Word of God and in partnership with a teaching priest. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit in partnership with the written word and in partnership with a teaching priest. They now begin the journey of transformation. Someone shout it, say transformation. One more time, say transformation. Transformation is defined as the process that makes you become like Christ in experience. It's called transformation. So the Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 12 when you read 1 and 2 it says, I beseech thee brethren by the mercies of God that you offer your bodies unto God a living sacrifice holy and acceptable. He calls it your reasonable act of service. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. It's the Greek word aeon. The thinking pattern that comes with this system. Then it says, be ye transformed. Are we still here? And that by the renewing of your mind. Be ye transformed. So this is the journey. I submit to you that the most difficult phase in the believer's evolution is the journey of transformation. The reason is because transformation is not a gift. It depends on your partnership with the Holy Spirit. You can decide to resist his transformation. And because he's not a demon spirit, he will respect you. So the face and the level in the spirit you should have attained after a year or two because of your refusal to cooperate with him through that transformative process. After 10 years, you can still be a babe in the spirit. A church goer but a babe. Even a pastor but a babe. And the Bible says a babe, a child now is unfruitful in spiritual things. Someone say transformation. One more time shout it, say transformation. So I agree that you are a believer. I do not doubt your salvation experience. But are you on that journey to transformation? There are evidences. Evidences to transformation like you will be learning. The first evidence that you are transformed is that you begin to cultivate what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, it says, which was also in Christ Jesus. The excellence of the believer as far as your faith walk is not just dependent on the health of your spirit, but your extent of transformation. Many, many believers are saved, but they are not transformed. And this is why God cannot do much with them. Again, I repeat, many believers are saved, but they have refused to contend for transformation. Either because they do not understand the life-giving, transforming ministry of the Holy Spirit, either because they have rejected the Word of God and its power to purify, to change, to transform or they have rejected the ministry of a teaching priest. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15 says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. It says they shall feed you with wisdom, wisdom and with knowledge. Is someone learning? So let's, let's follow our progression again. So an unbeliever becomes a believer even though a carnal one immature, unfruitful in spiritual things and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Word of God and a teaching priest, that journey to transformation begins. Now something happens when you make progress here. Something happens. When you become commendably transformed, you move to the next phase. It's called empowerment. Empowerment is useless 
to a believer who is not transformed. Listen carefully. Empowerment is useless to a believer who is not transformed. Unfortunately, and with all due respect, the Pentecostal charismatic circle, we talk a lot about the anointing. We like the anointing. We like power. The reason why we fall and stand and fall and stand and roll and shout and there's no evidence of growth is because our attention is on power, not transformation. Jesus was not in a hurry to lay hands, nor impart, nor release the Spirit upon people. Look at the ratio of transformation to empowerment. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. If you're a man of God here, let me advise you. Do not be in a hurry to impart the anointing. The vessel matters. When the vessel is small, it makes the oil look small. The oil will always assume the shape of the vessel. So she comes to the prophet and the prophet said, what do you have in your house? He said, nothing except a little cruise. And the prophet said, the problem is not the oil. The vessel, go and borrow vessels. Expand your capacity in the spirit. He says, borrow not a few. As soon as there were more vessels, the oil started multiplying. Say transformation. The name given to the process that makes you become like Jesus in experience. I am amazed at the fact that when Jesus became a man, not even him was imparted as a child. Jesus, he had to wade through the journey of 30 years. But the first thing he did from age 12 was to go to the temple and he was learning, even though he was the word incarnate. The value of his impartation, receiving the spirit, came upon the fact that he had now been transformed. And the test of his transformation would follow his encounter with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he was driven to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Satan comes to him and Jesus replies by saying, it is written. That is the signature of a transformed believer. You have come to honor what is written greater than what you have seen or you are seeing, greater than what you are hearing or you've heard. Someone say it is written. Yeah. So an unbeliever becomes a carnal, immature believer and then through growth, you become transformed. Then transformation makes way for empowerment. Now hear this. At the point you are empowered, your name changes from a believer to a witness. You see that you don't just become a witness because you are a Christian. There are many Christians who are not witnesses. A witness is a validator. It's a legal expression. And I, I, I don't want to bore you with all of that. A witness is only needed in court if there is contention. The assignment of the witness is to bring validation to a statement. Am I right on that? So when God calls us witnesses, we are not just mere believers. It means we have been empowered, number one, by the mind of Christ, the truths of scripture, and then number two, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now he can send us. It is only a witness that can be used to bring revival, not the believer. The believer is in Christ, but cannot be used as an agent of revival. You see why we have so many believers in church, so many believers in America with all due respect, and yet the move of God seems to be in trickles. It is because we have not transited through growth, transformation, and empowerment to become witnesses. Someone is evolving in this conference to a witness. Say amen. I say to you again that someone is evolving in this conference to be a witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Abraham had begun his walk with God, but his name did not change. He was still Abraham, even though he was with God. But a time came when a transition happened and he was changed to Abraham, the father of nations. A transition always happens and with that, your name would change. Same thing happened to Jacob. From Jacob, he now became Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God. I'm praying for someone here. In the name of Jesus, the level of transformation that will allow for profitable empowerment. May you begin that journey with the Holy Spirit. 
For someone, God is answering you right now. Why you see yourself having dreams, prophetic encounters, and you see yourself on crusade grounds doing mighty things for the kingdom, but physically you never seem to step into that prophecy. God, the version of you the anointing is looking for is not this version. There is a version of you the oil is looking for. And every time the grace of God comes to you, it finds an unrenewed version. And the oil will have to wait patiently until you grow. Someone tell yourself, myself grow. Myself grow. Prophesy, myself grow. Grow. Become transformed so that you will become that vessel. Are we still learning? Remember I told you that the move of God, the program of God, territorial transformation, revival, happens when God finds available, aligned, and trained vessels. And so I'm walking you through the pathway that it starts by default for all men as unbelievers, unsaved. Then you transit to a believer albeit an immature one, void of spiritual intelligence. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in partnership with the written word and a teaching priest, they are enhancers to your transformation. Then you get to a point of maturity in the spirit. You are furnished understanding the ways of God. Now that gives way to spiritual empowerment and that happens by the spirit of God. At the point of empowerment, you assume a new status in the spirit. You are not called a believer, even though you are still a believer. But the new status is a witness. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses, validators. Validators. Validators of my claim. And then, notice, he never defines jurisdiction for believers. But the moment he mentions the ministry of witness, he now says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Let me show you how witnesses function. Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. The Bible tells us that a very potent witness called Philip, he went down to Samaria. Witness is always location dependent. And the Bible says there he preached Christ unto them. Then it says the people gave heed with one accord. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There were extraordinary manifestations of God's power. Are we together? And then the next verse says there was joy. There was joy in the city. It always affects the territory when you are a witness. A true witness does not stop um, with your personal progress. If all you have to show us as far as your Christian work is concerned is that I'm doing well, the word of God is working for me, my children are doing well, I'm happy, I'm prospering, I'm loving God, you are still a believer, you are not yet a witness. You cannot be used to fan the flames of revival because the moment you transit to become a witness, it no longer becomes about you. You see, the burden of being a witness is that self dies as God's program grows through your life. So it's no longer about you. You have learned the rudiments that keep you healthy, strong, healed. Now you focus on God's program. The language of a witness is that I took this city for Jesus. I took this territory for Jesus. And there are two elements that I use to describe a witness. One is light. The other is salt. Not to bore you, but there's something interesting about light. Light does not have to be everywhere to shine. You can place light from one point and it can shine all across. So the Bible says, let your light. The word let means permit, allow. Do not hinder. Let your light so shine before men. Help those under the anointing. Let your light so shine before men. Are we together? Then he says, you are salt. The thing I like about salt is that the moment it gets into the pot, it changes 
you don't see it again. To know there's salt there, you have to taste the food. The moment you drop salt, it dissolves, but it is not weak. And the thing about salt is that it is never too late to add salt. Never too late to add salt. Hmm. Are we learning? So when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, you step into a system and sometimes you look very frail, but you begin to influence the system. Your first spoon taking your meal and you know there's salt here. It says we are light and we are salt. So one last time, let me walk you through that journey. An unbeliever to an immature believer to a transformed believer to an empowered believer to a witness. Can we run it one more time? An unbeliever. Next is an immature believer, a babe, an infant in the spirit, even though saved. Then through the journey of transformation, that person becomes a transformed believer. Am I right on that? Next is empowerment, an empowered believer. Then an empowered believer becomes a witness. There's no point knowing your assignment or knowing your kingdom assignment when you are any other thing but a witness. It will be useless to know what God has called you to do if you don't contend to be a witness because you will only know it and it remains there. You will never be able to act it out. There are many people like Jeremiah right from infancy, God showed them what he's desired to do in and through their lives. But because most believers think the journey is from being an unbeliever to an infant, then a witness. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And longevity in the faith does not automatically make you a witness. You have to engage. So don't tell me you've been saved for 20 years. Have you transited? Have you transited? An individual can be saved and based on his passion and his hunger, like it is resting on someone now, in one year, that individual can leap with the spirit and become so transformed, he can end the status of a 20-year-old believer, a product of hunger. The moment you get saved, listen carefully, no other thing in your experience is a gift again. Every other thing depends on your engaging. The initial salvation is a gift given to all men. But your journey from that point, the enablement comes from God. But you have to cooperate and partner with the Spirit. Who is understanding me so far? This explains why... We have many churches, but powerless believers. Every time you see a powerless believer, don't think power. What is wrong is transformation. Once transformation is right, power does not delay. It rests quickly. In fact, there are many people who do not pray for power. They just get to the edge of transformation and collide with authentic, genuine apostolic power. Are we together? The disciples never requested from Jesus to be empowered. They just submitted to transformation. Their empowerment was his idea. Hmm. That means in the program of God, my brother, my sister, listen carefully. There is a version of you an anointing is waiting for. And that anointing can wait for all your lifetime and never rest on you. The anointing is waiting right here. But for 10 years, even though having dreams about revivals, you have decided to stay here. Going to church every Sunday but remaining here. Hmm. And the spirit keeps crying. There is so much I want to do with you. You even desire the more of God. But for most people, we have not been educated spiritually to understand these transitory systems. My assignment this morning is to walk you through because represented all of these levels, all of these faces are captured in this auditorium and to the many who are falling. For many, unfortunately, many, even in America, they are still unsaved. They don't need transformation. 
they don't need empowerment. You don't transform an unsaved person. It's a waste. A natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. It will not even profit him. So laboring to teach and do a lecture or a conference and education to someone who is not saved is a waste of time. I hope you know that spiritual knowledge is not like secular information. You can understand your schoolwork with intelligence. There are people who are smart. But when it has to do with this spirit business, your organs of interaction with the spirit has to be activated by the presence of the life of God. If that software is not activated, you can even be a professor and you will only listen to spiritual things intellectually and they will never make sense. For instance, there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. That is against common sense. It is against logic. For instance, to dance your way out of trouble. No, you call the police out of, your, out of trouble. Yet in the spirit, Paul and Silas at midnight, the Bible says that they prayed, they sang, and everyone heard them suddenly. An unbeliever, a babe in the spirit, barely saved but confused about life and destiny, not understanding anything spiritual whatsoever. A churchgoer, convenient if it's fine, if it's not, then doesn't matter. Then one who has begun a journey with the Holy Spirit intentionally, the journey to transformation, then empowerment and your name changes and you become a witness. It is at this point that Saul turns to Paul. It is at this point that Cephas becomes Peter. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Are we learning now? This is very powerful. My life changed when I understood this. Now to answer the question for which we are gathered here this morning. Why revivals die? From my description so far, I expect that you should begin to have an idea as to why it looks like the move of God is not sustained. I preached a message many years ago, why revivals die. And I had one reason when I preached it, but I've grown in the spirit. Now I have two. And I will tell you why revivals die. Someone who loves God is about to learn. Are you ready? Number one. The first reason why revivals die, in fact, the first reasons why they do not even start is the absence of available, yielded, and trained vessels. I already taught you that. Provided there is no yielded vessel, God is limited, even though almighty. God is limited, even though almighty. And the reason why God seems to be limited when there are no men is not because he's powerless. He's all-powerful. But he so designed his economy such that the earth, activities upon the earth, is man dependent. So as mighty as God is, he will depend on the cooperation of men. Are we together? The spirit and the bride say come. Not the spirit alone. The spirit can say come, but there has to be a bride on earth who answers come. The spirit and the bride say be healed. The spirit and the bride say go forward. The spirit can say go forward, but there's no bride to echo what the spirit is saying. Everyone who was healed yesterday, you see, their healing did not start yesterday. Their healing had been finished on Calvary. The Spirit had said, be healed. But the bride came. We came to partner with the Spirit to say, be healed. Once the Spirit and the bride agree, the Word will always become flesh. The Spirit agreed, but it took the bride, Mary, to say, be it unto me. And for as long as Mary did not say, be it unto me, Jesus could not come. Even though from the foundations of the earth, the lamb was already slain. Prophetic realities remain in the realm of the spirit when there are no human agents to birth it. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's how the word became flesh. That's how every word would become flesh. The word of healing becomes flesh when the spirit and the bride says, be healed. 
the word of prosperity becomes flesh when the spirit and the bride says prosper. The word of restoration becomes flesh when the spirit and the bride. The spirit has ever been there. He's an ancient spirit. The first of the Godhead revealed in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. But the problem now is the preparation of the bride. Look at me. How many of you know that it took a long time for Esther to be prepared to meet the king? And for as long as she had to be prepared, the salvation of the Jews was at, were at stake. It takes a while for a bride to be prepared. Talk to me. Takes a while. Takes a while. So the Bible says Esther, a potential bride, but not enough to stand before Ahasuerus. And she interacted with a certain kind of oil that Haggai, the keeper of the king's virgins, gave. And she kept rubbing that ointment. Mm. I said rubbing that ointment and I just felt a surge of the power of the Holy Spirit just through my hands. Maybe there is an Esther being made right now. Making an Esther in the Spirit. You will stand before the King. It is true. It is in your destiny. But not this version of you. Not this version of you. There is a version of Ruth that cannot meet Boaz. And I'm not just speaking naturally. I'm speaking prophetically. It's not enough to be available. There is a transition that must happen. I hope you are learning this now. So don't just come to a man of God and say, lay hands, I want to take over America, unfortunately. The oil, the man can lay hands on you, but this version of you will waste the experience. You will fall down, but truly you will not receive anything. Your results will show you did not receive. But you can grow and just buy a sermon online because you are already transformed ripe enough for the anointing. You may not even have to meet the person directly because your hunger, you have satisfied this journey, this pathway. Some of you, as you came for this conference, you have pressed towards transformation. You and God have been in that business for a long time. It's the reason why I don't even have to lay hands on you. As the word comes, as the worship comes, because you are already in a season. Just one step to being a witness, an authentic witness, with power, with grace, with signs and wonders. Now listen to me. What I forgot to tell you was that a witness is beyond a preacher. When I talk about being a witness, I'm not talking about being qualified to stand behind a pulpit. No, because the Bible has many witnesses. Let me name some of them for you. Abraham, Gideon, Esther, Daniel. Not all of them preached, but all of them defended the name of the Lord. A witness is a validator and validation goes beyond the altar. A businessman is a validator. A politician is a validator. Make reference to my teaching, Redefining the Coming Revival. I have done it, a, a, a revival series. I wouldn't want to go into that. It's important we have an expectation, a picture of what the coming revival that has been prophesied by many patriarchs. Many of them have gone to be with the Lord. They left with prophecy that before Jesus returns, there will be a move of God. A move of God that will spread like covid Let me tell you the truth. Many people interpreted COVID in various ways, but there's an interpretation we forgot to see. How easy it is to take the globe. That is one interpretation of COVID many people forgot to see. That in one moment, a virus that did not have a passport, no visa stamped, didn't respect any immigration policy of any nation, that virus, as small as it was, <laughs> penetrated systems and structures, unhindered, kept parliaments awake all through the night. What do we do with this virus? In a matter of days, it had spread across the globe. And for the first time in our modern history, the entire globe had to drop aside differences and shut down. Ah. 
So this is how he can move to that in the twinkling of an eye, America catches the fire just because, just when you think you are done, Mexico catches the fire, Canada catches the fire. Come on now. Africa catches the fire. That when missionaries want to rush back to Africa, God says, no point. There are already others there catching the fire. Catching the fire. You believe this? Now, let me tell you this. You're, you're tempting me to do my evening's teaching now, but the Bible teaches us to resist temptations. Hallelujah. Look at me. Do you know how easy it is to light a candle when the candle is prepared? It does not, it takes seconds Everybody here, as many as we are, everyone's candle can be lit in a moment when the candle is ready. The spreading of the fire is not the problem. No. Most of our revival prayers are wrong. Oh God, come. That's not the prayer. He's always wanted to come. Oh God, build the vessel. That is the prayer. Let the bride be prepared. The spirit is ready. Don't just say Maranatha. He's always wanted to come. But Mary, are you prepared? But Esther, are you prepared? But Ruth, are you prepared? Yes, sir. Let the weight of your glory fall. Let it cover all the earth let the weight of your glory fall let it cover all the earth 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 let it cover all the earth. Please sit down. So the first reason why revivals die, in fact, the first reason why they do not, I sense, my God, shortly I'm going to be asking Pastor Nat to come here and we'll blow up this place this morning. I just sense there is, we are redigging ancient wells. I sense there is an ancient well over America. It's been covered for a long time. An ancient well over America. There is a, a, a spiritual, listen, listen, listen. You believe what you're hearing? Mantles never go back to heaven. No, it's not recorded in scripture that any mantle return back. That means the mantle upon the fathers who walked upon America, Billy Graham, Reinhard Bonke, the D.L. Moody, all of the great men, that mantle is still hovering around. But the problem is that the vessels, the vessels, the vessels, when you pray revival, don't ask God to come. It's not a wise prayer. Ask God to build the bride. The spirit is ready. Every time the bride is ready. Let me tell you this. Hold on. Revivals do not have dates. Revival is ready to happen the day the bride is prepared. Now, there are prophetic seasons, I understand. But territorial revivals do not have dates. No matter what date you see for a revival, it will never happen if the vessel is not ready. So God can give Abraham a prophetic word that the nation of Israel will be in captivity for 400 years. But because it took a longer time to prepare Moses, 30 years was added to that prophecy. And it looked like God lied. God said 400 years. Salvation came after 430 years. God can tell you I'm changing your family 2024, but it may happen 2028. Not because he lied. That was when a savior, a witness became ready. Do you know what that means? The moment 
you assume a position of laxity and spiritual unseriousness. You have disrupted someone's season. Because whoever is connected to you, your carelessness, your prayerlessness, your wordlessness is not affecting you. It's affecting an apostle who should rise because of your witness. It's affecting a prophet who should rise. It's affecting a young lady. If Mordecai is not ready, Esther will suffer. Mordecai needs to be ready to call Esther. Then she becomes queen. And if Esther does not become queen on time, her man will kill the Jews. There is timing to this thing. Hallelujah. We're about to pray. The first reason why revivals die and don't even start in the first place is because there are no vessels available, yielded, and trained. Let me give you the second and we'll wrap up this session. Don't miss tonight. Invite everybody you can find in America because it's going to be both rain and fire. The Holy Spirit is both. He is rain and he is fire. When he reveals himself as rain and as a river, he is giving life. But when he reveals himself as fire, it is empowerment for service. He doesn't empower as river. He empowers as fire. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. The second reason why revivals die is called exhaustion. Pastor Nat, the sheer humanity of men. The fact that the vessels, the, the treasure is in earthen vessels. We get tired. We get exhausted, unfortunately. Now, let's learn a lesson in the next five minutes from the candle. Because when it has to do with the impact of a witness, the Bible uses a candle neither do men light a candle are we still here now there is a big advantage with the candle because every other part that connects with the fire is inside the candle but there is a part that is out and from that part once the candle is lit the candles fire is always at the expense of the size of the candle. Did you hear what I said? The continuity of the burning is at the expense of the size. It burns, but there is a side effect. Something begins to happen to the candle. It melts from the same fire, not an enemy. The same fire that gives light is the same fire that depletes the candle. Fire burns everything in front of it, including the candle that holds it. So there is a problem. Because when the candle begins to reduce, it gets to a point where it no longer can hold anything and it dies. And with the candle finishing, the fire dies. This is why revivals die. When you own a candle, it begins to burn. And for as long as it burns, sometimes even five minutes to the death or the finishing of the candle, it still burns. And then suddenly, and it's gone. So, those who make scented candles decided to add something to the candle to keep it burning. They put the candle in a container that keeps retaining the shape of the candle so that as it melts, it remolds back again. Did you get what I'm teaching you now? That rather than burning and it just melts away, they now take the candle and there is a safety system, a container that is not affected by the fire and they put the candle in it. Is that not true? And it will burn longer than usual. I'm showing you why revivals die. 
There are many candles, but they are naked, unprotected. There is no system of covering. They have not understood the system that sponsors longevity in the kingdom. So that candle can manifest as a pastor, as an apostle. I'm burning for two years, and by sheer human exhaustion, persecution, bringing exhaustion, name calling, bringing exhaustion, the controversy that comes with following Jesus, eventually the candle begins to deplete even though you are a prophet deplete even though you are an apostle and one day unknown to you the light dies and then you begin to ask where was that great man in america where was that great worshiper i will tell you it is not always about righteousness or unrighteousness exhaustion can destroy can deplete the major reason why revivals die is because the vessels are earthen. Don't forget this lesson from the candle. But we are going to do something that is done to a scented candle. There is a system in the spirit that helps candles to remold back to their shape so that even though they are normal, the melting process does not become a disadvantage. The melting process creates a circle. So while you are being used, as the wax drops down, it doesn't drop to fade. Before it molds, it assumes the shape. The Bible says, has thou not seen, has thou not known? I want to show you a secret now. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 30 to 31. If you understand this secret, you have found the key to longevity as a vessel. Let's read verse 30. You can see it, but I can't. So I'll need you to read it for me. Are you ready? Isaiah 40 and verse 30. Let's shout it in concert if you can see. Ready? One to go. Stop. Stop for a moment. Did you see that? Even the youth shall faint. They don't faint because they did anything bad. I hope you know that the youth, the symbol of youthfulness is strength, vigor, vitality. But he's saying because the vessels are still human. Listen, man of God, hear this. If you're a minister of the gospel, I'm explaining to you why you find pastors getting exhausted and at a point they say, I'm not doing this ministry again. There are candles that are burning, but they've not understood the preservation system. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men, even with their energy, they shall utterly fall. I like the next word. But. Come on now. But. There is still a way out. That I am human, but there is still a way out. That I can be exhausted. I know, humanly speaking, you cannot drive a revival for beyond one, two years by your human strength. You will be exhausted. Many tried it and they fell, but it says they, not everybody will choose this pathway, but they that wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. Everybody say renew. Shout it again. Say renew. Renew. Renew means reform. Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagles. Is that in your Bible? It says they shall run. And when you expect them to be weary, they have outsourced the technology in the spirit. They will run and not be weary. It is very human to be weary. Elijah was weary. Jesus himself was weary. And yet the Bible says there is a provision in the economy of God that men can run with this fire. And even after 30 years, they are not weary. It says they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let me show you that system. Waiting upon the Lord is beyond fasting. Most times when we say wait upon the Lord, 
we mean leave food for a while. Mm -mm. Waiting upon the Lord is the name given to an overall spiritual process that brings stamina and stability to the believer. And I'm going to list three of them and then we'll pray. Number one, the first key that is responsible for the longevity of vessels, fanning the flames of revival and rising beyond your humanity is called a systemic prayer life. Write it down. Not just a prayer life, a systemic prayer life. The believer who has a systemic prayer life, a prayer life that was designed intentionally, according to Leviticus chapter 6, now I think verse 13, that the fire upon the altar should burn day and night, it shouldn't go down. If the fire is upon a candle, why do you say it should not go down? Because there is a system to keep it burning. Are we learning now? A systemic prayer life. I'm revealing for you the apostolic model that was handed over to the church by Jesus. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Are we together? And in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayer. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. James 5.13, is any man afflicted? The Bible says, let him pray. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Are we still here? A generation that ignores the strategic ministry of prayer has lost the art of remaining. I don't care what else goes right in your life. If you do not have a systemic prayer life, there is no longevity for you. Not as a witness. Are we together? The Bible says the fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. America, when you pray, you keep the fire burning. And I'm not just talking of prayer that does not touch you. Your prayer has to be heartfelt then it has to be effectual. Fervent means that your energy, your emotions should be connected to it. And then effectual means your prayer must be word compliant. The scripture compliancy of your prayer is what makes it effectual. It is not the shouting. You can shout amiss. God is only committed to hearing the prayers that are consistent with his word. And this is the confidence the Bible says that we have in him. That when we ask anything, listen, according to his will, he heareth us. Not anything we want. When you connect your desires to his will, then it looks like he answered your desire. But the truth is that he answered his will. Because God only does what he says. Not what we want. If it looks like he does what we want, he has done what we want that is consistent with what he has said. Once you can find and God said, then you have connected your prayer to become a winning platform. I introduce to you a mysterious secret that America is gradually forgetting. And not only America, with all due respect, the nations of the world. Go and study the moves of God. For running every major move of God were intense moments of consistent, systemic prayer. Personal prayer, corporate prayer. It means the prayer ministry must be revived in America. Not just as, not just as a way to show spirituality. And I'm not just talking of Father, thank you. God bless you and that's all. No, no, no. Genuine prayer. Prayer with travail. Prayer that produces power in the spirit. Someone say, I will pray. Shout it. Say, I will pray. There is the energizing of the spirit. He's called the spirit of prayer and supplication. That investment of God can rest upon an individual and empower you so supernaturally to pray. There's no time to show you 
the four benefits of prayer according to scripture. But one of them, which is a major reason for prayer, is your spiritual growth and evolution. Luke chapter 9 and verse 29. The Bible says, And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment became white and glistering. Prayer is not just for receiving things. A greater assignment of prayer is for your evolution. A weak you becomes a strong you when you pray. A timid you becomes a powerful you when you pray. There are transactions in the spirit that happen when we pray. At midnight, even in prison, Paul and Silas prayed. The church refused to pray and James died. The same angels that delivered Peter were there when James was in the prison. But because the church did not pray, Herod wanted to vex certain Jews and he beheaded James. And the Bible says the church kept quiet and he proceeded further. Satan always proceeds further. When we keep quiet. He touched your child. Out of three, he touched one first. And he watched you give an explanation. Then he proceeded to the next child. But the day a mother here takes on your priestly regalia. And says, no way. Thus far have you come, not my child. This child is a prophet, not my child. This child is an apostle, not my child. I will not let you touch Abraham, not Gideon. This child is a child of prophecy. If you can hold on to the horns of the altar, America, I tell you there is no power. There is no power. Not ancient powers, not, not hexes, not spells. There is no enchantment and no divination that survives an authentic Authentic systemic prayer life. Authentic systemic prayer life. Intercessors rise. Rise. It's time for prophetic intercessors to rise from America. It's time for prayer cells, prayer groups. It's time for men and women who know the art of priesthood. I will stand upon my watch and set myself upon the tower. I will see what he will say. Deborah's arise. Don't let the devil destroy America. God is counting on men and women, people who can arise. Influence the parliament from your prayer altar. Rewrite the narratives of people from your prayer altar. Let me tell you the truth. When you find a man a people who are committed to a strategic systemic prayer life with understanding I show you a people who will do much every revival started as a joke until it became a revival they prayed then they prayed again then they prayed again then they prayed again then they prayed a little more then they prayed again until the spirit of prayer consumed them and they began to partner with heaven and mighty things began to happen. Do I tell you about E.M. Bounds? Do I tell you about D.L. Moody? Do I tell you about all of these generals who sojourn here, your own soil? They've gone to join the cloud of witnesses. Someone must receive that mantle, that mandate of prayer. Shake away prayerlessness. It's an attack on your destiny. It's an attack on your children. It's an attack. Being educated doesn't stop you from prayer. No. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and pray, and pray, Pray and pray, not complain, not just wish, not hope. No, listen, prophecy depends on prayer to happen. The speakings of God depends on prayer to happen. There was a woman called Anna the prophetess. In spite of the prophecy about the arrival of Jesus, she stayed in the temple and prayed. One month became one year. One year became one decade. She said, I will stay and pray. America, pray. 
we've brought you a mantle of prayer a grace for genuine prophetic intercession that you will pray until you shift spiritual climates you can pray your portion in this nation to be delivered to you don't sit down and fold your arms and say whatever will be will be it is only evil that will be you have to pray and reprogram your realities Pray over your children. Pray over your schools. Pray over the churches. Pray for the men of God. Men of God, pray for the congregation. Pray. Pray. This is the apostolic model we have lost. We need to fan the ambers of our prayer life. Prayer. He spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Number two, we have to wrap up. Number two, the second apostolic model that was delivered to the church that is responsible for fanning the flames of revival and sustaining the same regardless the limitations of the vessel. Listen carefully. You must grow to respect the supremacy of the word of God above all other experiences. You must grow to respect the supremacy of the word of God above all other experiences. Prophetic experiences, emotional experiences. The moment the word of God becomes subject to your emotions, you cannot find the flames of revival. It is written is greater than I saw. It is written is greater than I heard. It is written is greater than they told me. If I see wrong, I can use it is written to change it. Are we together? A nation that respects the supremacy of the word of God is a nation that has crippled the hands of evil. I commend you to God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. In the beginning, John 1 was the word. And the word was with God, the Bible says. And the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. I like verse 3. It says, through him, all things were made through him. And without him, outside of him, was not anything made that was made. Nothing is made outside the word. Pastors, let's return to the word. When we deviate from the truths that are consistent with the written word, it becomes superstition, not the faith practice. When you want to pray for the sick, beyond the laying on of hands and administering the power of God, you have to get to the word and build your confidence. Now, I am, you know this now, this is a prophetic ministry. And so I don't downplay visions and experiences, but most people have lost out of God's program because they have exalted prophetic experiences above the word of God. The margin of error is very high because you who is having those experiences, you will still grow and you realize that what you thought you saw, it was a level of your immaturity that made you think you saw it that way. But the word of God has been tried seven times. Don't build ministry on visions. Build it on the word. Don't build ministry on prophecy. Build it on the word. Don't build believers on visions and miracles and prophecy. As much as you see them here, this is a ministry God has so lavishly granted us grace on this wise. But this is the basis. I live in the reality of encounters, but my entire life revolves around it is written. Someone say that. It is. So go back home and edit a lot of superstitious living from your life and get back to scripture. If you never have any dream in your life and you can find what God has said, run with it. You will still be a winner. Did you hear what I said? Visions and prophecies are important and there's a place for them. But there are people today who birthed great global ministries. They never had any encounter. 
they just found written in scripture. I like the way Jesus introduced his ministry. He went to the temple and saw where it was written, not said, written, written. You've heard what was said, find what is written. Do you know why I love Pastor Nat as he ministers? Because the times we've shared together, there's almost no song he brings that he could not tell me the scripture that led to it. And I said, this is powerful. And I'm saying it sincerely. We've shared quite some moments together and he can receive the song from the spirit, but he will still connect his scripture to it. Revivals die when we become superstitious other than word-based. We now begin to run the programs of God based on emotion. So you will think God said, stand this way. Very soon, that singular unique act will become a dogma. Very soon, it will become a practice and you will destroy the potency of what God is doing. There are personal instructions God has given me as a person, but I cannot teach it as a doctrine because it, is, it does not have a doctrinal stand from scripture. If God asks me to jump seven times, it's a unique dealing between me and God. I cannot create a doctrine out of that. You will mislead people because he did not tell everybody to jump seven times. Are we together? Our pulpits, with all due respect, are full of a lot of prophetic activities that are good, but they are highly subjective because they were personalized trainings. They were not for the congregation. Because they worked for us, we carried them to the pulpit and forced it on people. And we are the only ones who are receiving the results because it is only us God told to obey that way. But this is what applies to everybody. This is it. We are redigging ancient wells. I show you why revivals die. People have lost the art of holding on to the four horns of the altar. Pray for me is a very popular saying among believers now. Please pray for me, I'm too tired. Then they say it again. Then they say, keep praying for me. And while it is good to intercede for others, everybody must become the prophet of your own destiny. My joy will be fulfilled. If at the end of this conference we can stir up a handful of people who understand, respect, and covenant with themselves to engage in prayer as a lifestyle. Is somebody learning? And then return to the ministry of the word. Preachers, don't study the Bible just for sermons. Study the Bible to understand the ways of God. I'll be teaching you something very powerful tonight. There is an angle to why revivals do not deliver as intended. You'll be learning tonight that even a revival that is ongoing can lose its potency even though it is not dead. Every revival is like a tray. It carries something from the spirit to deliver to people. But if you do not know how to engage revivals, it is possible that a move can last and not deliver with it everything God desired. There is still something else the vessel must learn. I'll be teaching you tonight. It's called the fullness of Christ. There are moves that have come, but as soon as the moves died, they produce serious error. Because there was something about God they refused to embrace. Every revival should deliver the fullness of Christ. And like you'll be learning tonight, the fullness of Christ is a tripartite manifestation of his nature and character, his wisdom, and his power. Listen carefully. If a revival does not deliver, tonight we are going to talk about the fruits of revival. What does revival deliver? If at the end of revival, the only thing that is received is holiness, that revival was not thorough. 
Every revival reveals the fullness of Christ. And when he comes, there is a tripartite manifestation. Number one, his nature, his character, returning to righteousness and moral excellence. But it does not stop there. A genuine revival delivers his wisdom. It is that wisdom that helps the believers to excel within the cosmos. Then the last dimension delivers power. Now, when a revival happens and the vessel is not well trained, he will shut himself at the wisdom of God and the power of God and only promote holiness. So you will find a people who are holy unto God, but they are not productive as a people. And so a revival would die because although they are chaste, they are morally nice, upright, there is no wisdom. They can't raise their children. They can't do anything. And the move becomes a curse because they rejected the fullness of Christ. So when a next move happens, people would say, don't follow this move. The last one that came brought people who were holy, but they did not have wisdom. And then there's a move of God where you find wise and intelligent people they would have accessed the wisdom of God, but their lifestyles. You cannot deny the outworkings of the wisdom, but character-wise, it cancels out every manifestation. So pastors are raised from that move and they will become sound communicators of revelation. But when it has to do with character, you see that now? Their character becomes an apology. Then there is a final error. Those who embrace his power, they are power drunk, no wisdom. They cannot raise a congregation. Everybody is falling down with every meeting, but there is no growth because they rejected his wisdom and rejected his character. This revival is bringing you the nature of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, and the power of Christ. Did you get that? The nature of Christ, a people who have solid character, character that can be attested to by everyone that this is a Christian indeed. But in addition to that character, men of wisdom, believers are not dummies. Dominion is wisdom dependent. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. Wisdom is speaking. With me are riches, wealth, and honor. Is why there are many believers who are poor. They are broke in every nation. They love Jesus, but they received his character and ignored his wisdom. Revival was not complete for them because it only delivered the nature of Christ, but did not bring wisdom. So they are not able to take care of their children. They are not able to scale their influence within society. And very soon they become an apologetic minority that cannot do anything much for the kingdom. Then we have the final phase. You can have wisdom, but one demon spirit can shatter your business. At that point, you do not need wisdom. You need power. Because demons are real. Spirits are real. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in all thy works. Through the greatness of thy power, shall thy enemies submit themselves. When Satan wanted to destroy Babylon, Daniel was already wise, but he needed beyond wisdom. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, that was not the business of wisdom again. That was power. <laughs> I'm showing you what you must receive. And for a global family following, return to holiness and righteousness. Receive of that nature of Christ. But don't stop there. The revival still has on that tray the wisdom of God. When that wisdom comes upon you, you refuse to be small. It transits you to greatness. Whether in ministry or in life, you become global. Being a more effective witness, displaying the excellency of Jesus. And finally, if you are wise, and you are not empowered. The reality of Satan and his determination to fight the program of God will catch up with you. So from now until this conference in the U.S. is done, as the Spirit of God walks like a patient waiter, serving the fruits of this revival, make sure you pick all three. Don't choose one. 
and leave the other. It's a feast of fat things. On that tray is the potential to embrace the nature of Christ. Warding of everything, encumbrances around your life, lusts and desires and things that destroy you, they can die as you receive of his mercy. Then you receive his wisdom. That is the cure to the poverty issue you are praying about. Ignorance is not a demon. You don't cast it out. It takes knowledge. Wisdom is responsible for that. It is through wisdom that a house is built. And then the power of God. We leave this tree for tonight. Are we ready to pray? Please rise. Revival comes. Let me invite Pastor Nat. Thank you, sir. Truly honored to have you around. Sir, I just sense in my spirit, can you play any hymn, any ancient hymn? I want us to connect to a fountain. There are many hymns that came, anyone at all in your heart. And whilst you are standing, everyone, I just want you to see the cloud of witnesses. I want you to see Reinhard Bonke. I want you to see Billy Graham. I want you to see perhaps your grandfather, those who serve God with integrity. In one minute, let me walk with your imagination. Maybe a hymn that will remind America again that those who wrote this hymn loved Jesus and that the hymns only continue when the love remains. Thank God for the many contemporary songs we have. But please, let's go back memory lane. America, this is what it looked like before we came. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I'm going to make an altar call and I want us to relieve here in America Billy Graham's crusade. What's that song they always sing when they make the altar call? Someone remind me. Come again. Just as I am. Now, they've gone. And it's not human worship, but my goodness. We the children and the grandchildren. Now, I'm going to make the altar call. And as Pastor Nat plays this, you are in this place and you need Jesus. Even if it's for one person. I remember Billy Graham of blessed memory watching him as he would make that call and just like the thousands gathered you would see people come they will come young and old as Pastor Nat starts please come God bless you come let's celebrate them as they come come to Jesus come 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 Come, come, run to Jesus. Come, Koinonia, let's celebrate them. They're coming to Jesus. Remember what I taught you. An unsaved person can become saved. A saved person can become transformed. The transformed can become empowered. The empowered one becomes a witness. Let's keep clapping as they come. Young and old, male and female, come. Hallelujah. Amazing. This is the Jesus America worshipped. This is the Jesus the fathers of America served. We are back to remind America that Jesus is still the same yesterday, today and forever. He loves America and he wants the soul of America back. It is a sound of revival. Join them. Please come. Just help those under the anointing. Hallelujah. Now, please lend me your attention, all of you. 
Thank you very much, my dear brothers and my sisters. Billy Graham is no more. He's gone. Reinhard Bonke is no more. He's gone. T.L. Osborne is no more. He's gone. But thank God we are here. Extensions of their legacies. But more importantly, thank God for Jesus who never dies. He died, but he's alive. He sent us to remind America again. Remember where you are coming from. This is how America was built. Beyond intelligence, it was built on Jesus. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Now for all of you who are here, my brothers and my sisters, please let me have your attention for a minute. Some of you are crying. Some of you, your grandfathers were standing many years ago where I'm standing now. They led many to Jesus. Who led us to Jesus? Perhaps this is why God brought you here. You're still yet to join them. Come. There is always room at the cross. For someone, let me speak to someone right now who is watching by way of television, by way of the internet. We're here in America and um, preaching Jesus, finding the flames, redigging ancient wells. And perhaps you're saying, Apostle, I listen to you very carefully and I know that I am right at the bottom of that flow you described. I want to make it right with Jesus right now. Wherever you are, you're in your home, your office, your car, perhaps just sitting on a recliner, a couch. Can I start afresh with Jesus? Absolutely. It is never too late with Jesus. So as I lead these ones in prayer, let me request that you join in that prayer, but do so believing, do so believing that it's a new season for you. Amen. I'll give you an instruction before I lead you to pray. Once I'm done praying, you would notice there are counselors. They're standing at the aisles. They're having cards. And as you're on your way back, they would slip a card to you. Please do well. Fill it physically and hand it over to them. Or you can scan the QR code. That includes those who are following online. You can scan the QR code. Let's know that you made a decision for Jesus. Amen. Lift your right hand if you can, as high as you can. God bless you. Say this after me as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus. One more time, shout it. Say, Lord Jesus. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, the power of Satan, the power of hell, and the power of the grave is broken over my life. I am a child of God. And from today and forever, I live for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the Oh, come to the Father, 
Congratulations. 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 Amen. Now, I'm going to request that you pick the cards. Once you have your card, please do well to return back to your seats rejoicing. It's a new season for you. Thank you. Let's give them a big God bless you. Give them a big God bless you. Hallelujah. Now, just let me your attention and two announcements and we'll wrap up for this morning's session. Were you blessed, by the way? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, tonight is going to be rain and fire. Yeah. Hallelujah. So do well to invite everyone within the Dallas area. There's still room. We've opened up more doors for people. And invite your loved ones, those around Houston. They can drive and come. It's going to be an extraordinary moment. Pastor Nath is still going to be with us lifting up worship. Pastor William McDowell is going to be with us lifting up worship and I will show you the final phase connecting to this revival series. And tonight will also be an impartation. If you're a minister of the gospel, come ready to receive. Something from heaven will rest upon your life. We'll pray for America. We'll pray for pastors. We'll pray for churches. And interestingly, you are in your election season. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak over America that the purposes of God and his counsel for the nation will stand. And then let me charge you the final instruction. Please come with your prayer request. How many of you believe that the Lord answers prayer? Hallelujah. I have watched with wonder the power of God as far as answered prayer is concerned. So please make sure you come. Write it. You can receive that of your loved ones. Come with it. We'll collate the requests and I'll pray on them and we'll just speak, make great prophetic declarations. And I wanted to write whatever it is you're trusting God, a miracle. We'll still be praying for the sick. I'll be speaking over your life. And this is the sound of revival. Is this a good place to close? Rise on your feet, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for your, your life. Thank you for teaching us why revivals die. Thank you for helping us understand that even though we are earthen vessels, there is a system in the spirit that can help us to keep the revival flames burning. We thank you and we love you. Thank you for everyone here. Lord, we pray that your glory will be revealed in a greater measure tonight. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that as we leave for this short time before we return, in the name of Jesus, let it be a moment of reflection, encounter for someone. I bless you and I decree and declare you remain blessed forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. Okay, just, just a moment. Um... For all the workers, I believe, as um, if you've, um, you've received that announcement, please, for the meals, let me just say this, for the workers, we're not allowed to eat within the vicinity, so please, let's respect, the, let's respect um, what they have put in place. Now, because of the weather, even though we thank God, how many of you know that it's been supernatural over your weather here? Yes, I understand it was so hot so hot but yesterday and today we've seen the mercy of God I think we should give Jesus a big hand clap amen now I know that many of you will not be returning uh, before the evening session so we decided to get the other auditorium the Will Rogers Memorial Hall is open for everyone you can go there just to rest 
catch your breath, meditate before the evening. They didn't want to leave all of us just roaming around, especially for the weather. It's not safe for our health. So the Will Rogers Memorial, please, protocol security, you may do well to lead the people. For those who do not know, it's just a 10 minutes walk, I understand. 10 or 5 minutes walk. You literally can stroll there. No eating within the auditorium, but it's open. You can rest, take your children, refresh, think through, plan, pray, prepare. And then we're here 5. The gates are open from 3 or 3.30. So we have just about an hour or two. And then we're back for the final session. Do well to send... Um, the messages to as many people, those who are not able to make it, please, they should connect. Let the sick connect. Let the oppressed connect. Jesus is still revealing himself here. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be blessed and we'll see by evening. Amen. When did they start liking me? Can I tell you this? When God is silent, learn to hear the voice of silence. I'm praying tonight. Everything you have been carrying, this is the month to give birth to it. Your weak beginning will experience dimensions of favor you have never experienced.